Hello folks. For the first of Video Guys picks, I have chosen the D'Angelico XL DC for double cutaway. And uh, just to get this out of the way right up front, this is obviously designed by D'Angelico to go head to head with the S335, which happens to be one of my favorite guitars and uh, is also the thing that attracted me to this guitar when I saw it hanging on the wall here at More Music. And I'll walk you through what my steps were as I kind of got impressed by this guitar. When I grabbed it off the rack, first thing that stood out to me was the feel of the neck. And it is just excellent craftsmanship. Uh, the neck, the binding, the frets, the fretboard, are this transition from one to another is just so smooth that uh, when I took a guess at the price, I guessed much higher than this guitar actually is. Um, it does have a maple walnut maple neck. You can see the stripe of the walnut in the middle of this. It is a five ply laminate maple top sides back on this guitar. Flamed all the way around. I mean, really just an impressive looking guitar. But since they are going head to head with the Gibson ES-335. Let's just talk a little bit about some of the components and the comparisons that we can make between the two guitars. Uh, first of all, when you're looking at a semi-hollow body electric guitar, the acoustic properties are very important in this because you do have a center block that goes down through the guitar. Uh, in this case, it is connected to the neck of this guitar. They call this a neck through set neck. Uh, so the bridge, the pickups are all mounted to the center block. And given the way electric pickups work, you've got to have some fairly strong acoustic properties to keep this from just sounding like another solid body guitar. Uh, and this one does. And it shouldn't be surprising. Uh, the name on this guitar, the D'Angelico name, is probably known by a lot of guitarists. Uh, for me, it was one of the first guitar brands that I learned because a beautiful D'Angelico New Yorker was on the cover of my very first Mel Bay guitar book. And I remember at nine years old thinking it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Um, you know, obviously looks wise, it's got the Art Deco style to it. Uh, but this is a modern guitar. But the way that they've incorporated the D'Angelico heritage into this is pretty impressive. Uh, John D'Angelico made fewer than 1,200 guitars in the period where he was hand building in New York between the 1930s and early 1960s. The development of his original large top acoustic guitars uh, was because players in the 30s and 40s who were playing with big bands, the Gibson L5 that most of them were using really couldn't deliver the volume to overcome the brass instruments, and so they just couldn't be heard. Uh, John found a way with his guitar design to make an arch top acoustic that really projected, had a lot of volume, and it felt great. They were simply exquisite guitars, and nowadays they're selling for twenty-five dollars to $35,000 for the originals. When D'Angelico was resurrected by its new owners back in 2012, they collected as many of the original D'Angelico acoustic guitars and brought them in conducted MRIs on them uh, because they wanted to see everything they could learn about the internal structure, the bracing, uh, the contact points, the neck tenon shape, all of these things that they couldn't do any other way without destroying one of these classic guitars. So they figured out a way to get that type of quality build into mass production. And all I can say is with this guitar, they've done a great job of doing it. So let me show you what I mean. I'm going to put my amp on standby for a minute and turn my lav mic off so it's quiet and I'm going to let you hear a reference between my voice and just the acoustic volume of this guitar. Okay, stand by. Okay, the lav mic is off now, the amp is on standby. Uh, I'm coming just through this mic here. I want to give you a good reference of just the volume and sustain of this guitar. So check this out. Still going. That's pretty impressive. 
Okay, I'm going to turn that back on. Uh, hopefully you see what I mean there. I mean, this is just impressive. And the sound comes across in the tones. I, I'm hoping that you could hear the beautiful tones, uh, even though it was me playing it at the beginning. But this is a just fine sounding instrument. It has Seymour Duncan 59 humbuckers, neck and bridge on here. Uh, two pneumatic bridge. It's got the traditional stop bar tailpiece. Ebony control knobs, which is a very nice touch. Uh, all mother of pearl inlays. Got the classic stair step and swoosh, uh, if you want to call it that, at the bottom of the pick guard that is uh, kind of a D'Angelico trademark. They've got the Chrysler building outline up here that uh, became uh, another trademark of their guitars over the years. Just, I mean, a beautifully carved headstock, but it's just a well-made guitar. It's got the Grover Super Rotomatic tuners, which I hadn't had experience with before, but they are extremely smooth and extremely fast. They're a 14 to 1 ratio tuner, but they're just effortless to tune, and the guitar seems to, <laughs> seems to hold up pretty well, uh, staying in tune during the amount of time I've been in here playing on it. Uh, 24 and 3 quarter scale, just like a 335. This has a 16 inch radius neck, uh, whereas uh, the 335 has a 12 inch radius. A little bit flatter fretboard, but I really like the feel of this. The neck carve is almost identical. It is a C shape. This may be, if there's a difference, it feels a little bit thinner, but it's less than a millimeter if it is. Uh, if, you're, if you like a 335 neck, you'll feel right at home with this. It has a bone nut, whereas the 335s have the Graftec nut on them. Uh, the 335s also have a rosewood fretboard. And this one, and I was holding up for a minute to even get into this because I know what some people are going to think. This is a Pal Ferro fretboard on this. And I kind of had my sushi moment with this Pal Ferro fretboard. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, we, we spend a period of our life thinking we don't like raw fish until we eat sushi and then we realize, yes, we do like raw fish. Um, I didn't think I liked Pau Ferro fretboards. Uh, and I found out that the reason that I hadn't liked them before is that they were not finely sanded. Pau Ferro is actually a wood that is between rosewood and ebony in density and hardness. When it is fine sanded like this, it feels much more like an ebony fretboard. And this is just glass smooth. It's just wonderful. And many times before, I think because of the lighter color of Pau Ferro, they try to make it more as a rosewood replacement. And whenever it's not sanded as finely and you can feel some of the texture in the grain, it kind of gives you the impression of a softer wood when really it isn't. This is just finely done. I love everything about the neck and the feel of this guitar. It is just incredible. Um, and the other thing I like about it is the fact that it does have the Duncan 59 pickups in it, which are wax potted pickups. Uh, the pickups that were used at least in the 335 that I was comparing this to were um, Gibson pickups that were based on mid-60s PAF pickups that were not potted. Uh, so they wanted it to, to be a little bit microphonic to pick up some of the resonance of the guitar. This guitar, the resonant properties of it are so strong that I feel you're getting, in my mind, a tone that I like a little bit even better than a 335 out of the combination of these potted pickups, the solid center block that they're using in here, and the acoustic properties of the guitar, which are very strong and they come across through these pickups. And one of the other things that I really like about this guitar is if you want to get into some high gain stuff, between how well the center block works, the fact that you have wax potted pickups in this, if you want to get into some heavy bar chord, Foo Fighter type stuff, <laughs> I mean, it's there with you. It'll take a lot of volume. It's got great feedback suppression. I'd say, you know, a little bit better than the 335 does, actually, and it's probably because of the potted 59 pickups in here. Now, one thing that I haven't talked about yet, um, 
which is one of the things that really, one of the few things I should say that really didn't impress me about this guitar. It does coil tap. So let's take a listen. I should say coil split, because that's really what this guitar does. It does split these 59 pickups. And let's take a listen to the neck pickup. Okay, and middle position. And down in the bridge position. Um, it gives you an added texture, I will say that. Uh, especially if you want to combine uh, a humbucker with a split sound. You've got a few more textures you can go to here, but the basic thing that gets me is that these Seymourdeck and 59s were designed to be some of the world's best humbucking pickups. The ability to coil split them is just an afterthought. They don't sound that well coil split. Some pickups do, some pickups don't. These in particular don't sound that great to me. Um, I would have preferred that the push-pull functionality be more um, something like phase, uh, parallel series, that would have really given this guitar a really kind of modern vibe to it, even more so than it has. Uh, the other thing that I'm not particularly wild about is the tone knobs are audio taper pots rather than linear. Turning it down over halfway. Until you get down to that last 30%, that's where all your difference in tone is. And it's a little bit hard to dial in a tone with these. I prefer linear taper pots so you've got a wider range to deal with. But in a guitar like this, these are small, small beans to me, really. Uh, this is just a super fine guitar. I've got to go back again to the neck. Everything about this neck just screams build quality, down to the way that the edges of the frets are rolled. Everything just feels fine on this. If I had to today choose between this and an ES-335, and consider that the, you know, the lowest tier of Gibson ES-335 maps at about $300 more than this, uh, and that is their bare bones. To get one that has the appointments of this guitar, you're talking $900 to $1,000 that you're going to pay for the Gibson name over this. I do love the ES-335s, but uh, today, if I had to take one of these guitars home, this would be the one I would choose. It fits me. I love the look. Uh, it is just a beautiful instrument from top to bottom. That's all you can say about it. So if you're in the market, for a semi-hollow body electric, this needs to be on your radar. The D'Angelico XL DC for double cutaway. Hope you enjoyed this and see you next time.